Hello, Pastor Hank Kuhneman here from Omaha, Nebraska, Lord of Hosts Church, the church that I pastor. I would love for you to come out and visit us here in Omaha, Nebraska. We've got a radical church. But I'm so glad that you joined me today because we're going to talk about questions that Jesus is asking. And this is very important as we ascend, as we continue to go to a, a higher level. In the book of Revelation chapter 4, there was a call. And the call was given to John the Apostle. Come up higher and I will show you things that will come hereafter. That same ascending, that same call is giving uh, by God to you and even to us that are in the church right now to ascend, to come up higher. And, and, and in order to do that, we need to understand that the Lord himself is asking questions. Now, this should not, you know, surprise us that the Lord is a God that asks questions. We know that in the book of Luke chapter 2, Jesus in verse 46, it says, it came to pass that after three days, they found Jesus in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and, watch this, asking them questions. So we're going to talk today about what are some of those questions that God is asking us. Now you might say, well, you know, Pastor Hank, why is it important that we answer these questions? Because there is something that is happening right now in the earth. And the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that arise, shine, the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Darkness has covered the earth, and gross darkness has covered the people. And I've heard scholars say that that gross darkness is literally mental oppression. Some people are literally being caught up in the fear-mongering spirit in the earth. They're allowing anxiety. They're allowing the, the fake media to form their narrative. And what they don't understand is, with the spirit of fear and doom and gloom, they're even moving into end-time eschatology that is not often based by the spirit of God, but by fear-mongering or the spirit of fear. So we need to understand, what are these questions? What is happening? Well, you have light and you have darkness, but light is going to overcome the darkness. God prophesied uh, years ago, and he said, there's a revolution of light that is coming upon my, my church, but upon the earth. Well, a revolution of light, the word revolution is a purposeful overflow, and I'm here to tell you that God is on purpose with all the things that we're seeing overthrowing the darkness that uh, is in the earth, and we are heading into some incredible days. So let's talk about these questions. You know, the first question that we find in Scripture that God asks is the question to Adam, and I believe that these questions that I'm going to share with you today are relevant for now. Here's why. Whenever you study Scripture, you have to understand that there is the historical or the literal interpretation of those Scriptures. In other words, it historically happened, it literally happened. This is not a book of fables or fiction. But also there's a prophetic application that, that often speaks by a prophetic narrative by the Spirit of God for the current season that we're in. So the first question is, notice this, Adam, where are you? Now, how does that relate to today? God is asking the same question. So this is the question, where are you? And God is asking it towards his church. Where are you? And he's asking this because pastors, leaders, even Christians are avoiding standing up in this hour in the glory that God is bringing, and in a powerful anointing of boldness. And God is asking us, where are you, church? Where are you, Christians? Where are you, leaders? Are you willing to stand right now in a time of darkness and be that light? Are you willing to stand against a woke culture and against trends that are trying to make the, the kingdom of God subcultural? We are never called as the kingdom of God to be subcultural. In other words, whatever the culture is, that's what we agree to. We come under, we conform to it. No, we are called in the kingdom. We are not of this world, Jesus said. We are to be counterculture. We are supposed to show this culture how we are supposed to be. So God's asking, where are you? But also we noticed that they were hiding, Adam and Eve, is it, they were hiding. They covered themselves with fig leaves. And the reason why God is asking this question today of his people and of pastors and Christians is because just like Adam and Eve cover themselves, there are those that are covering themselves, spiritually speaking today, they're covered in fear. 
They're covered in excuses. They're covered in avoidance of being a voice that stands up right now as part of God's redemptive plan. You say, well, what is God's redemptive plan? God's redemptive plan is a plan of help and a plan of hope. No matter if there is a warning from God, you will always find that there's a plan of help and a plan of hope. So let's talk about these questions. And as we ask these questions, you need to go to Mark chapter 6 and verses 45 through 40, uh, 51. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus is literally testing the disciples. And this is very important to know that, you know, God doesn't tempt any man. That's what the scripture says. But he will allow you to be tempted. That's why the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 8 that God himself put the children of Israel in the wilderness to test them, to try them to prove them, to see what was in their heart. Watch this. To see if they would live by uh, uh, bread alone or by every word that would proceed out of the mouth of God. Would they keep the commandment of God? It was a test. So in Mark chapter 6, you see that Jesus told the disciples in verse 45, go out into the boat. And so they went and Jesus himself went out to pray. And this is amazing. This is why prayer is so important. While Jesus is praying, the disciples uh, are literally, you know, two and a half, three miles in the middle of the, of the, of the lake and a storm begins to arise. You know, the waves are, are, are rising. The boat is rocking a little bit. Hey, listen, a lot of people are getting their boat rocked right now. The church is getting its boat rocked. But yet Jesus is praying, it's dark, watch this, can God appear when it's dark? That's one of the the questions that I ask is, you know, is it possible for God to show up in darkness? And and people, you know, they want to get the church out of here. Well, it's just time to escape because it's getting dark. And so they make the book of Revelation the testimony of the beast and the testimony of the mark and the testimony of the tribulation rather than the book of Revelation is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus. It's about his glorious church. It's not about escapism and different things like that. So here Jesus, it's dark. He's praying. God does appear in darkness. The book of Deuteronomy says that God called Moses into the dark cloud where he was. The Bible says for six days that the evening, that's darkness, and the morning were the first day all the way to the sixth day. God worked when it was dark. He's working when it's dark now, to bring a revolution of light, a purposeful overflow, uh, uh, overthrow. Now watch this. So Jesus is praying. When you pray, you will be able to see through the darkness. This is why some people believe the fake news. They believe the things that are happening on the earth because they're not praying. No, they've got their face in front of, of the media, uh, and, and, they're, and they're being fed these narratives. So they believe that that is truth. They believe that that's reality. They believe that that's the way things are always going to be. Yet Jesus, because he's in prayer, could see through the darkness what was really happening, and he begins to walk out on the sea as we continue in this passage of scripture and it says that the the disciples were rowing contrary so there's a lot of people that it seems like things are against them i hear more people oh it's so harsh everything seems to be against me yeah but do you understand that jesus in the midst of your rowing in the midst of things seem contrary is literally walking out towards us the church towards you with the visitation The disciples now are in the boat, and they look up at Jesus, and they think that he's a ghost. This is where some people are at right now. They're taking the visitation of God upon planet Earth, upon the United States of America, or the nations that you're watching, and they're attributing it to evil. They thought Jesus was a ghost. That's what some people are doing. Oh, this is the, the, the gloomy days. This is, the, uh, this is darkness days. This is the end time tribulation. And they don't realize, wait a minute, Jesus is interjecting himself with a divine intervention to literally visit us with his power and with his glory. And the Bible says this, now watch this. This is so amazing to me. So Jesus, in verse 48, he walks now, And he intended on purpose to pass them by. So this was a test. Jesus on purpose was going to see what these disciples, that the things were contrary against them, what would they do? And so as a result, they finally realized, oh, this is a visitation of Jesus. Oh, the prophets, I guess, are right and we're right. And all of a sudden, they begin to cry out and Jesus gets in the boat with them. Isn't that amazing? God is injecting himself in the earth. 
His glory is what is going to overcome the darkness. Now, what's connected to that glory? I'm going to tell you. David said, I would have despaired. I would have given up unless I had believed to see, watch this, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Goodness and glory go together. So if God's glory is going to come, then there has to be a revelation, a manifestation, and a preaching and a declaring of the goodness of God. This is why when Jesus goes into the temple, the first thing he says is, look at me, I'm anointed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach what? Good news. Matthew 24, people often quote all the Matthew 24 scriptures regarding the end time. Earthquakes in various places, wars, and now they're saying rumors of wars. And Oh, it must be the end. Yet Jesus told his disciples, and he's telling us today, he said, no, this isn't the end yet. He said, hey, boys, when you see these things, it's not the end, but yeah, there's going to be birth pains. There's going to be some things that you're going to feel. There's going to be some things that are going to be challenging. Things are going to be painful, but it's still not yet because people ignore Matthew 24, 14. Watch this, talking about goodness and glory. He says, the gospel, which is the good news, shall be preached. So there needs to be a preaching, a declaring of God's goodness. And he says, as a witness, that signs, wonders, miracles, the manifestation of the glory. And then it says in that verse, then the end shall come. And so I want you to understand that we are in the days that God's goodness is coming. And so as soon as Jesus got in the boat with the disciples, it says in another translation of this same passage, that immediately... Now, some translations don't use the word immediately. They use the word supernaturally or miraculously. In other words, this was a supernatural transporting of the disciples and Jesus to the other side. In other words, it was acceleration. You have to understand that we are in the season and the hour right now of acceleration. What took, you know, maybe takes a year is going to take a month. What took, you know, uh, hours is going to take seconds. God is going to make up, watch this, for lost time. You think because of what treasonous people are trying to do, thieves are trying to do. Proverbs 6, 31, if the thief be found, he must pay back sevenfold. There's a payback coming. And it's going to be to the heads of those who are trying to steal, kill, and destroy what God is wanting to do through his goodness and his glory. And so here's what we have to understand. You know, God is, is moving in a very powerful way right now. And, and, and you can't get your eyes so much on, on all that's happening. And people say, this is the new normal. It'll never get better. Whoa, wait a minute. Not when Jesus gets in your boat. This is why we're being tested. You get accelerated. Let me tell you about one test that's happening right now. And we're going to look at more questions. One of the tests that, that's happening is is I find it very interesting. So in 2019, the Spirit of God prophesied through our ministry here, uh, through my lips, and he said that there would be a plague and that we were not to believe uh, what they would say. Well, it's turned out that there's been a lot of, a lot of lies regarding COVID-19 and mandates and vaccinations and so on and so forth. And so when the Lord prophesied that, he said there would be this pandemic, this scamdemic, or what some you know, call a pandemic, and he prophesied that this would begin to happen in the earth. And, and I say this because we are in a time right now where, you know, people think that this is just the way that it's absolutely going, you know, to stay. But we're in a test. And the test has been, you know, regarding even the pandemic or regarding the 2020 stolen election. Yes, it was stolen. How do we know? August 16th of 2020, the Lord prophesied through these lips. And he said they would steal the election. They would divert and lie. And they would delay the election through a planned chaotic thing. And they would think that they could steal God's nation. And God says, do you think that they will be able to steal my nation from me? This was August 16th of 2020. So that's how I know. I don't care what the news says. I don't even care what the evidence is. I know what God said. And the evidence supports it. So here's the point. When this happened, some of you know, the prophetic voices out there and some of the people got on and began to really come against the prophets and be harsh concerning them. You know, calling them out, calling them false. And when you do that, you have to be careful because a true throne room prophet who represents the heart of God, that's the highest level of the prophetic. That's why God said to Aaron and Mo, uh, Miriam, 
If there be a prophet among you, I speak in visions and dreams, but not so with my, my, my servant Moses. I speak heart to heart or face to face. And so when you carry God's heart, that's what prophecy is, his heart, his mind, his will, his, his intent, his agenda, and you communicate that, and people attack that, they literally attack the very heart of God. So there's a test going on, just like the disciples there in the boat. And the test is this. In Numbers 13 and 14, there were, uh, you know, 12 spies that went into the land. And two had a different spirit. And it was Joshua and Caleb, the Bible says. They had a different spirit. They didn't have a spirit of fear and anxiety. They could take the word of the Lord and they could see the future. They could receive the prophecy and see that prophecy fulfilled. You know, the 10 spies couldn't. All they could see was what the news was saying, what was happening in the earth. It looked impossible. Giants. How could America be great again? How could uh, inflation come down and our economy re be rescued? How can gas prices come back where they're at? How can God ever, you know, raise up uh, what he promised even through his church? And so people often do the same thing. You know, they get themselves in a place where, you know, they start doing exactly what the ten spies do. They base everything off of what they hear, everything off of what they see, and whatever they experience, and they forget about the prophetic word of the Lord, and they discount it as being false. And that's what the people did. And so the Bible says in uh, Joshua 14 that these ten spies cause the people's hearts to melt. This is why we're in a test. And do you know what killed them? We've been talking about this pandemic, this plague. The Bible says they were, they were killed God sent a plague, and it took out the ten spies. And it's amazing that it was a pandemic or a plague that caused those who only went by what they saw, heard, and felt, and not according to what God said prophetically, that there would be a land flowing with milk and honey. America would be great again. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And as a result, they caused the people's hearts to melt, to faint, to get into unbelief, to believe the media more than God and his prophets, and as a result, a plague killed them. And the same thing is happening to leaders today. They are being taken, uh, and they are being held by, by the hand of God, and they will not be part of how God is going to use leaders in this new era. And so in Joshua 14, you find Caleb going, hey man, I can see the future you know, the ten spies, they caused the people's hearts to melt. When the test came, they caved in. And here's what Caleb literally says in Joshua 14. He says, the ten spies went by what they saw. But what they saw and what they reported, watch this, was not accurate. That's what Joshua said. He had a different spirit. He said, but not me, not Joshua. Caleb says, we had a different spirit and we held on to what God said to us. So let's talk about these questions. These questions are so important. One of the questions Jesus asks is in Mark chapter 8. And this is the story where he literally goes to Bethsaida and he takes a blind man and the Bible says he takes him out of the city. Now why did Jesus take this blind man out of the city? Well, because when he was going to open up his eyes, it was about perception. It was about perspective. He didn't want the man who was blind to get the world's perspective, or what man is creating as a narrative or as a perspective. So he leads him out into an open place. He anoints the man's eyes, and, and, and the man begins to see, and, he, and, he, and Jesus makes him look up and says, what do you see? And he says, man, I see uh, men walking as trees, or I see a movement happening among men. Do you see a movement of God? Do you see Jesus walking on that water in a visitation, or do you see a ghost? You see doom and gloom tribulation, end time beast, and, uh, you know, Gog, Magog, and eggnog, <laughs> okay? And so as a result, Jesus touches his eyes again, because it's important that we have the right perspective. But the question is, what do you see? And he says, man, now I can see every man more clearly. In other words, I can really see now what's going on among mankind, among the nations. So God's asking, what do you see? I ask you, what do you see? Can you see the future? You know, Mark um, chapter 6 is a very important thing. You know, here the disciples, the Bible says, you know, they're in a place and Jesus has been preaching to the multitudes and the Bible says it's dark and the day was far spent. 
In other words, man, it's dark. It's late. Is there anything that can happen now? It's too late is what their mentality was, the disciples in Mark 6. And uh, so they come to Jesus and said, hey, uh, Jesus, let's, let's send them away. <laughs> in other words, let's rapture them. Let's, let's just, you know, write some new books and get some new tapes out there. And, and let's just get the church out of here. And, you know, because that's the time that we're in. Because it's dark. It's too late for there to be any kind of manifestation of God's goodness or his glory. And so, like I said, Adam, where are you? Church, where are you? Pastors, where are you? Christians, where are you? This is a time to stand and let your light shine as part of that revolution of light, that purposeful overflow, uh, overthrow that God is doing. And so I want you to see this. So, you know, when, when they said, send him away, Jesus said, no, I'm not going to send him away. And it caused something to happen. It was called God's compassion kicked in. You know what God's compassion is? When God himself comes down and makes himself a part of the darkness or the situation or the need. And that's what we're seeing. So let's look at another question. Jesus in Matthew 11 he, 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 he asked some questions here, and I think this is very relevant. He asks, what did you come out to see? I think this is a, a relevant question that the Lord is asking his church today. What did you come out to see? Now, notice he said that not about the evangelistic office. He didn't say that about the teacher office, the apostle, the pastor. He said it about the prophet's office. And I think if there's anything that God is asking is, what, what did you come out to see? What is your perception regarding who's a true prophet, who's a false prophet, what the prophets prophesied? And so we've got to get our perspective right and understand that God has been speaking clearly. But what did you come out to see? Are you wanting them to perform? Did they not meet your expectation? You know, I had some people say, well, when, when, when the prophets prophesied about Trump winning the election, well, you know, oh, they were wrong. No, they weren't. He won. He won. It was stolen. And so, you know, some people, you think, what'd they do? You know, go and bet their house and lose everything? I mean, is that the ridiculous thing? In other words, you know, we have to be careful. And if you're a prophet, be careful that you don't get caught up in giving what the people want. You're not here to perform. God is more concerned, I can say it this way, about his heart being communicated than he is about the reputation of the one that's speaking, the prophet. So people to back up, and, and begin to apologize for what God said. Either he didn't say it to you, or you didn't believe it, or you were an echo, you weren't really a voice. But God's more concerned about his heart being communicated than he is the reputation that often comes. What did you come out to see? Then he goes on and he, and he clarifies. He said, did you come out to see a reed shaking in the wind? That's what we're seeing today. You know, are you, are you looking for a reed? Are you looking for the leaders to bend towards the secular media, the fake news? Are we, are we looking for our leaders to bend towards the woke culture and, you know, continue to cancel, uh, you know, things that we, we know are, are scriptural or even common sense? So, you know, that's what the reed did in Israel. It, whatever way the wind would blow, the, the wind would blow and the reed would just bend. That's what preachers are doing. They're just bending, afraid to be bold. Christians are afraid to be bold. They were afraid to vote for a guy who had mean tweets. And they keep just, you know, bending towards the culture of the world rather than standing strong and, and, and standing in the culture of God's kingdom. Then he goes on, he says, look, what did you come out to see? A, a king clothed in soft raiment? <laughs> he said, listen, kings... Uh, uh, you know, in soft raiment, belong in, in king's palaces. Well, in other words, now the appearance of the, of the king, he's comparing it now to John the Baptist because Jesus says, look, that's not John the Baptist. He didn't come wearing soft raiment. You know, there's this, there's this, uh, this is why God's asking that question. What'd you come out to see, a, a king in soft raiment? You want things soft, okay? You want things nice. You know, nice is not a fruit of the spirit. Loving kindness is. Love, joy, loving kindness is part of the fruit of spirit, but not nice. Nice is, yeah, it's a nice thing to do. It's an amiable thing, but nice often has conformity with it, okay? Jesus was not about conforming. He was a nonconformist, okay? He was very loving. That's why he told the woman with the, uh, with the uh, caught in the midst of adultery, hey, where's your accusers? That was, that was loving, but then he said, hey, sin no more. That's also loving too. And so you have to understand that people want soft messages. They want nice messages. They want uh, prophets to change their message and adapt to the soft, woke, cancel culture definitions. 